if you will, the gospel according to St. John, and we'll look at two different pieces of scripture. John, the 12th chapter, verses 12 and 13, says, The next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. John, the 19th chapter, verses 14 through 68. It was the day of the preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Paul asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. Topic is simply crucify him. Today we come celebrating Palm Sunday, remembering Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, where the crowd welcomed him in an impromptu parade healing him as a king. Fulfilling the prophecy that was made over 450 years earlier by the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah in 9 and 9. He says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. If I could pause just for a moment. Jesus did not send them to look for a stallion or a well-bred horse that runs in races. He did not ask them to go for an Arabian horse, a type of horse that is known for his strength, his loyalty, and his resiliency. Nor did he send them for a quarter horse known for his strength, or for an Appaloosa horse that's known for his intelligence, but for a donkey. A donkey is defined by many dictionaries as an African domestic are uh, for a human to be called a donkey is the same as one being called an earhead, a dumbbell, a dummy, a nincapoo, a meathead, a simpleton, or an idiot. Urban Dictionary says that a person that is equal to a donkey will be a bit on the soft side, slow-minded, simple, dim-witted, easily manipulated, and dull. But, oh, church, I ask, is that just not like God? For the Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 27 and 28, that God chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chooses the lowly and the despised things of this world, things that are not to nullify those things that are. In other words, when God gets ready to bless, he will pull the least expected person in the class and elevate them to class president. Amen. He will call the weakest among us to demonstrate his strength. Amen. He will call the smallest to bring down giants. Yes. He will call the greatest adversary among men and make him the greatest missionary ever. Yes. He will call a stuttering town man and make him a spokesman for him. So then Jesus chose the mode of transportation for his triumphal entry into Jerusalem was a donkey. Yes. As a background for the text for this day, John 12 and 1 starts out by saying six days before the Passover, Jesus visited the home of Lazarus, the one who raised from the dead, and his two sister Mary and Martha. And John tells us how Mary took an extensive bottle of perfume and anointed Jesus with it. And John wrote about Judas' denunciation of Mary's action and Jesus' intervention on Mary's behalf, making it known that what Mary was doing was anointing him for his burial. And John proceeded to tell us about the crowd that had gathered outside the home wanting to see Jesus and Lazarus. In the text for today, John 12 and 12, it starts out the next day. So here we are on Sunday, the Lord's Day, Palm Sunday, if you will. So John wrote, the next day, the great crowd 
Oh, church, as we read the Bible, we find out that wherever Jesus went, there was always a crowd. Didn't make any difference if he was by the seashore or on the lake or on the mountaintop or in the temple or at a tomb, whether he was reclining at a friend's house or traveling along a dusty road. John wrote that a great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus. For well, this is the prophet that, this is what the prophet wrote about, the one that was coming to deliver them. They heard about Jesus, the one whom many had received their healing from. They heard about Jesus, the one who they had put their faith in and their trust in. They were now following. They heard about Jesus, the, the conqueror who was going his way to Jerusalem. And John wrote that the crowd took palm branches. First, I read that palm trees enjoy a certain prominence because while most trees are seasonal, palm trees remain green and keep their leaves all year long. Yes. In an article, Why Palm Branches, the author wrote that in ancient time, palm branches symbolized, symbolized goodness, well-being, grandeur, yes. yes. steadfastness, yes. triumph, and victory. Palm branches were depicted on coins at important buildings. Yes. Palm branches were carved into the walls and the doors in King Solomon's temple. Yes. Palm branches were regarded as tokens of joy and triumph and were customarily used on festival occasions. Yes. Palm branches were used as a sign of victory. For yes. when athletes returned home after a game, yes. they would wear the palm branches, which yes. meant that they were victorious in their game. Yes. Palm branches were spread out on And they went out to meet Jesus, and they all began shouting, Hosanna. Yeah. Now the word Hosanna is a cry for salvation, meaning, save us, oh, save us, please, Lord. Yeah. So here we have this crowd calling on Jesus, please save us and save us now. The crowd shouting, Hosanna. Now, church, I understand that the word Hosanna is not a word that we often say aloud. It is not normally a part of our everyday speech. Words like praise God, hallelujah, and amen. Yes, yes, and the yes, truth yes. be told, most times we only say the word Hosanna, whether we come across it in print or in the scriptures or in the words of the song. Yes. But oh church, even though we don't say the word often, I believe that some of us have some Hosanna experiences in our lives. So oh church, we have some encounters. We have some close calls. We've had some narrow escapes. Yes. We've had Again, 
excerpts from the late Reverend S. M. Lockridge, and the title, the piece is entitled, That's My King. Yes. And he asked the question, do you know him? Do you know him? Lockridge said, the Bible says my king is a seven-way king. Yes. He's a king of the Jews. That's a radical king. Yeah. He's a king of Israel. That's a national king. Yeah. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of ages. Yeah. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. Yeah. And he's a lord of glory. He's a king of my king. I want you to know him. Yeah. And he's the greatest phenomenal that ever crossed the horizon. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. Church. Right. 
Father, we praise you, Lord God. Father, we ask you, Lord God, just to continue to be with us, my Heavenly Father. Father, we ask you, Lord God, just to open that heart, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to make that commitment to you today, my Heavenly Father. Lord, today, Lord God, that you walk, Lord God, walk through on palm leaves, my Heavenly Father, knowing, Lord God, that this is going to be your last celebration, Lord God. Lord, with your disciples, Lord God. Father, so Lord, we thank you, Heavenly Father. We ask you, 